Welcome to everyone. I am Arnaud de Lobel, R&D and Innovation Director at Quality Assistance, and I will give this introductory talk entitled Glycan Analysis in Biopharma, Challenges and Future Directions. First of all, very quick words about Quality Assistance. We are a CRO, a contract research organization that provides analytical services to pharma and biopharma companies. We were founded in 1982, 40 years ago, and we are today 240 employees located in a single site in the south of Belgium. We work in compliance with FDA and EMA regulations on all types of products, from small molecules to biologics, but also on cell and gene therapies and mRNA. To know more, feel free to visit our website. Let's focus now on the topic of today, glycosylation, and let's see first why it is often considered as a critical quality attribute of biotherapeutics. First of all, glycosylation is one of the most common post-translational modifications in nature. It is estimated that more than half of all proteins found in nature are glycosylated, but if we consider now therapeutic proteins only, the share of glycoproteins is even higher. A lot of drugs are actually glycoproteins, and that's the case of the vast majority of monoclonal antibodies, such as adalimumab, infliximab, rituximab, or trastuzumab. Antibody-based biotherapeutics, such as antibody drug conjugates, or some multispecific antibodies, are also glycosylated. But it is also the case of other modalities, such as FC fusion proteins, for example, etanercept and aflibercept, EPO, or granulocyte colony stimulating factor. On the pictures at the bottom of the slide, you find the five biotherapeutics that are among the top 10 selling drugs in 2021, and all of them are glycosylated. Let's go back now to the basics. What are glycans? Glycans are made of monosaccharides, the most common of them being presented on this slide. Some of them are neutral, but two monosaccharides are charged, and these are the two sialic acids, N-acetylneuraminic acid and n glycolyl neuraminic acid. This will confer specific properties to the glycans and thus to the glycoprotein. And these monosaccharides can be linked in different ways, as shown here, which will once again influence the biological properties of the glycoprotein. The N-glycans are linked to an asparagine residue. This asparagine should be part of a consensus sequence which consists in the asparagine followed by any amino acid except proline and a serine or a threonine. The core structure is made of two N-acetylglucosamine and three mannose residues. The first N-acetylglucosamine can be fucosylated or not. We can then have different classes of N-glycans such as high mannose, hybrid glycans or complex glycans and all these different structures will confer specific properties to the glycoprotein. There are also O-glycans that are linked to serine or threonine residues, and in that case there is no consensus sequence, which means that virtually all serine or threonine residues could be partially glycosylated. The different core structures are presented at the top of the slide, and these structures can be modified, sometimes with sialic acids. A few examples are provided here. The glycosylation of therapeutic proteins will depend on different factors. First, the expression system. It should be chosen, such as it produces glycans that positively affect the potency of the drug while avoiding safety issues to the patient. If needed, glycoengineering can be used to optimize the glycosylation profile and thus the physical, chemical and biological properties of the drug. And the second main factor influencing glycosylation is the manufacturing process. The cell culture medium, the pH, the temperature and also the production method, fed batch or perfusion. It's quite clear here that the process in a whole has a critical impact on the glycosylation of the final drug. This glycosylation profile will then impact the properties of the therapeutic protein. First of all, its solubility and stability, as glycans can mask hydrophobic amino acids and improve stability, and more specifically, charge glycans that may improve solubility. They can also stabilize the native structure and improve resistance to denaturation and protect against aggregation, which will improve the safety of the drug. Regarding pharmacokinetics now, 
Here, there is a critical role played by two receptors, MANOS receptors and ASGPR receptors. The presence of silic acids will improve serum half-life by masking galactose residues, and on the opposite, proteins containing non-human glycans will be cleared more rapidly. It should also be noted that the glycosylation of small proteins is a way to improve their pK. Glycosylation can also have a role on receptor binding, but in that case it will be receptor dependent. And finally, glycosylation can impact immunogenicity, as some glycans are immunogenic, such as those that contain a glycolyl neuraminic acid, galgal motifs of fucose with alpha-1,3 linkage. On this slide, I have listed the major glycans that will be found on monoclonal antibodies with their impact on the activity. As you can see, some glycans will lower the serum half-life of the protein, such as high mannose. Some will enhance the ADCC activity, such as non-fucosylated antibodies, while galactosylated glycans will improve CDC. Glycans containing terminal silic acids will have anti-inflammatory properties. And finally, some glycans can be immunogenic, as I said before, such as those containing galgal motif or containing n glycoline neuraminic acids. I think we have now set the scene for the next part that will focus on glycan analysis. Glycan analysis can be very complex as there are many ways to characterize the glycosylation of a protein at different levels. This characterization is required by the authorities. For example, ICH-Q6B requires the characterization of glycosylation for all therapeutic glycoproteins and the implementation also of release tests whenever warranted. But this is also the case of other general guidelines from EMA or FDA. This slide presents the different approaches that we use at Quality Assistance for glycan analysis depending on the type of glycans present, the level of analysis and the information required. These methods are similar to what is listed in several regulatory texts such as USP 129 that deals with the analysis of recombinant MABs USP 1084 on glycoprotein and glycan analysis, or European Pharmacopeia 2259 on glycan analysis. I won't go into much details, but you can see that the analysis can be done at the protein level, at the oligosaccharide level, as proposed in USP 212, or at the monosaccharide level, as described in USP 210. Of course, you won't have to perform all the tests, it will depend on the information you need, but also on the expected impact of the glycosylation on protein safety and efficacy. I will now give a few examples, starting with the analysis at the glycan level, which is probably, at least for monoclonal antibodies, the most widely used approach, both for characterization and release testing. The workflow is shown here. Over the recent years, with the availability of new commercial labeling reagents, the sample prep time are drastically reduced and it is now possible to prepare samples in less than an hour. Automation of the process is also possible. Whatever the labeling reagent used, the workflow remains the same. First, a denaturation step, then N-D-glycosylation with an enzyme that is most of the time PNGSF, derivatization with a reagent that will allow both highly sensitive fluorescence and MS detections, and finally purification. These labeled glycans are then separated by LC and detected by fluorescence for quantification and MS for identification. The identification principle can be the following one. First, you inject a dextran ladder in your LC conditions to calibrate your system and convert the retention time into what is called glucose units or GU. Then you inject your sample and based on the GU value, candidates are proposed for each glycan and this identification is confirmed by MS data. Databases are now available for different labeling reagents. Here is the fluorescence chromatogram obtained for three independent preparations of a monoclonal antibody using helix separation mode. The identifications were automatically given by the processing software and as you can see the analysis is highly reproducible as the three chromatograms are perfectly overlaid. The ratio of each glycan is calculated based on the relative areas of the different peaks. 
Here we have the chromatogram of a more complex sample, Eternacept, which is a fusion protein with more complex and glycosylation. But once again, glycans are identified unambiguously and automatically. The advantage of using instant dyes is the MS sensitivity. These dyes were designed to allow quick labeling but also high sensitivity in both fluorescence and MS. The arrow here shows a glycan with 0.6% of relative intensity. Here is the MS spectrum obtained on a state-of-the-art high-resolution MS system with 2AB labeling, not bad but quite noisy, and with a recent dye the intensity is much higher, which allows for better MS identification of low abundant glycans. Other separation modes can be used, such as mixed mode, here ion exchange and reverse phase, and in that case, glycans can be separated based on their charge, with first a massif with neutral glycans, monosylated, desylylated, and so on, which is very useful for highly silylated glycoproteins, such as fetuin or etanercept. Using another mixed mode column, here ion exchange and helic, a simpler separation between the different charges is obtained, and this method is perfectly suited for QC analysis of sialylated proteins. For oglycans, the approach is much more complex. First of all, there is no enzyme that is universal for oglycan release. Chemical release can be used, but it has to be optimized. In the example I will show, we used alkaline beta elimination under reducing conditions, which led to limited peeling side reaction. We did not label the glycans and we separated them on a PGC column. And finally, detection was done by MS in negative ionization mode. Here is what we obtained for etanercept and fetwin, which allowed us to quantify and identify different O-glycans based first on MS data, but also fragmentation data to confirm the structure of the glycans. Another approach is also to work at the glycopeptide level, which can be very useful to perform site-specific glycosylation analysis. In a regular peptide mapping, using reversed phase separations, glycopeptides are lost in the middle of non-glycosylated peptides, as you can see here on this chromatogram. In that case, you need MS to identify and characterize them. If you use high energy MS, fragments that are specific to glycopeptides can be identified, but as you can see, on the total ion chromatogram, they are much less easy to detect. Another approach is to, lose, to use helix separation. Here, we analyze the model compound RNAs B before and after deglycosylation. You can easily see that the glycosylated peptides are well separated from the non-glycosylated ones. And when you zoom in on glycosylated peptides, you can see excellent separation between the different glycoforms. Once again, this is a great alternative to reverse phase separation. And I will now finish with the analysis at the subunit level, which is a more recent approach, but also offers a lot of advantages. You probably know the enzyme IDES, commercialized by Genovis under the trade name Fabricator, but there is also the IDZ enzyme that has an improved activity for IgG2A and IgG3 mouse antibodies. Both cleave the antibodies below the inch region to yield FAB and FC fragments, and after reduction you obtain three subunits of around 25 kilodaltons. With this relatively low molecular mass, it is possible to get high-quality chromatographic separations, but also good MS resolution and accuracy. If you use helix separation, you get a very good uh, separation between the three subunits, but also, for the FC fragment, an excellent separation between the different glycoforms, as it is shown here. Quite interestingly, we showed on the therapeutic antibody that the different approaches that can be used gave very good agreement for the quantification of the main glycoforms G0F, G1F, and G2F. Even on complex glycoproteins, such as heat and acept, that is both N and O glycosylated, this approach can be used. Here, the sample was N-deglycosylated to analyze specifically O glycans, and then digesting using IDES. 
we obtain a very broad peak for the TNF receptor subunit as seen on the right of the chromatogram, but by analyzing the peak in small fractions, the composition in O glycans can be obtained as shown here on the different mass spectra that correspond to different fractions of the peak. And to conclude, I will talk about glycomics approaches that are not used much today in biopharma, but that can be very useful anyway. The idea is to use methods that are commonly used in biopharma, but to automate the sample preparation to make high throughput analysis possible. In this study, samples are sometimes complex, and we sometimes have to analyze blood samples. Some steps of the preparation can be automated, such as deglycosylation, labeling, or SPE purification, and then the samples can be analyzed by different methods, such as LC or CE, with fluorescence detection, MALDMS, or LCMS. The applications of high throughput glycomics are epidemiological studies, genetic or clinical studies, or diagnostic applications. This approach can also be useful in early development for the glycoprofiling of biopharmaceuticals, as I have shown before, when you have many samples to screen or during the manufacturing processes in order to optimize it. But high throughput glycomics can also have another important role in biopharmaceuticals development. Glycans are indeed responsible for a large part of inter-individual variations and biologicals may have very different activity depending on the glycocontext of a patient. To take an example, therapeutic immunoglobulins compete for FC receptors with immunoglobulins of the patient. And in this context, a patient with 20% of afucosylated IEGGs that bind quite strongly to FC receptors will be very different from a patient with only 2% of afucosylated IgGs. High throughput glycomics can therefore help to better understand the inter-individual variations of the efficacy of a treatment by analyzing the glycome of the patients. That's all for this presentation, it was quite quick, and of course we did not have time to cover all the details of glycan analysis, but if you want to have more details, you will find more information in these different publications that are shown here in this slide. It's now time to switch to the expert discussion to go deeper into the details of glycan analysis with the associated challenges and the future directions.